Hi, welcome to the screencast for Topic 16, Option E, Sections 5 and 6. Sections 5 and 6 are all about water, and one of the big concerns with water is the amount of DO, or dissolved oxygen in water. And the reason it's a big concern is because as water gets warmer, it's able to dissolve less oxygen because oxygen's a gas, and when temperature's warmer, it's going to expand more and be more likely to escape. So again, this is another issue with global warming that if waters are warmer, even a degree or two, they hold less oxygen and just small changes in oxygen have big effects on what plants and animals are able to flourish in our water systems. So um, it's a common indicator of the health of the water, whatever the DO level is. And fish need a minimum of 0 0.003 grams per liter, which doesn't sound like very much. But they also can only have a maximum of 0 0.009. So too high is also a problem for fish. O2 is nonpolar, so it isn't highly soluble. So that's why that number is so low. Organic pollution is measured by a body of water's BOD, biological oxygen demand. The more pollution that's in there, the more oxygen it needs to break it down. So BOD is measured as the amount of oxygen in parts per million needed by the bacteria to consume all the organic material in the water, typically in five days, or it could be some other specified time. But typically BOD is expressed in oxygen needed in parts per million for five days at 20 degrees Celsius. And the greater the BOD, the lower the water quality. That means there's more junk in there that the bacteria needs to clean up. So BOD is an indication of the dissolved oxygen levels and both are an indication of the quality of your water, or the health of your water. So BOD can be measured by saturating the water with oxygen and then leave it and remeasure after five days and see how much oxygen is left. That would let you know how much had been used or what the demand was. A BOD less than one is almost pure water. Five is doubtful pur purity. So you want to be close to one if you're drinking that water. And 10 is unacceptable. If the BOD is greater than the oxygen there, then the BOD is going to consume all the oxygen and then obviously your fish and other plants won't have oxygen and that's when you're going to see lakes die off. So bodies of water need a way to regenerate their oxygen or pollution occurs and just keeps building up. Foul smells are an indicator of foul water. I mean, I think most people know that if your water smells, you probably don't want to be drinking it. So organic waste is the um, reason for that. When organic waste is reduced instead of oxidized, then it forms things like H2S and sulfur, as most of you know, has that rotten egg smell to it. But that's letting you know there's not enough oxygen available for the processes to go on. So instead of being oxidized, stuff is being reduced instead. So... Um, what causes the BOD to go up? Big thing is what we call runoff. And runoff is just what it sounds like. It's the water running off our lawns and off of farms back into the lakes and the rivers. So uh, BOD will tend to increase when there's an influx of nutrients such as nitrates and phosphates. And those things come from the fertilizer we put on our lawns, from the pesticides and fertilizers that farms use. It's also from the detergents we use that go out with our uh, wastewater. Um, it's put out there as part of our treatment, water treatment process. Acid rain can also contribute to it. So there's a lot of things that can cause an influx of nutrients into our ponds and different water bodies of water. So the additional nutrients can lead to this process called eutrophication, which is basically a lake or a body of water dying. What happens is the extra nutrients cause algae to bloom. When algae bloom, it demands more oxygen. As the algae demands more oxygen, other plants and animals begin to die. As they die, then the BOD goes up again because those plants need to be decomposed. So eventually you end up with a lake that's anaerobic, doesn't have any oxygen left in it. So it's lifeless and then you start having the reduction going on instead of oxidation and you get the very foul smells. Another problem, another thing hurting dissolved oxygen and water is this idea of thermal pollution. A lot of different factories use water for part of their process. They often use it as a coolant 
for whatever's going on. But you can't just put warm water right back into the lake or stream because warm water dissolves less oxygen. So if the water is returned to its source warmer than when it was removed, it's going to decrease the amount of dissolved oxygen available. It's also going to increase the biological demand because increased temperatures increase metabolisms of the little things in the water. And it tends to neg negatively affect spawning, fertilization, and hatching of fish eggs. So got three different things going on there with warm water. All that add up to less fish being available in your water. And then water pollutants, um, other water pollutants besides just affecting uh, the dissolved oxygen and the BOD, other things that commonly end up in our water are nitrates. And again, those can come from pesticides and fertilizers. They can also come from other um, industrial processes. But nitrates can interfere with oxygen levels in babies. They can cause stomach cancer in adults. Heavy metals end up in our waters. Um, they interfere with the function of the metals that we actually need, like magnesium, calcium, and zinc. The problem with heavy metals like cadmium, mercury, and lead is just that, that they're heavy, so they're hard to bump out and remove. They're hard to remove from the water, and they're hard to remove from the body. Uh, pesticides, this can include insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. Um, which are poisonous. So when they run off, they create problems. Um, oftentimes it's the um, eutrophication process that they start. Dioxins um, are something with two benzene rings. That's where the dye comes from. And it's connected by oxygen, so the dioxin. They're extremely poisonous and a bad thing to be getting into our water. And then PCBs, which you maybe have heard of, stands for polychlorinated biphenyls. And they're used in electrical transformers. So again, electrical transformers shouldn't be getting into our water, but they do end up in our landfills and um, eventually can make their way into the groundwater. E6 then goes on to talk about how we treat water once we've used it in our house. So stuff that goes down your sink, how does that get treated? Because water goes through the water cycle, but we only have a finite amount of water. We're still drinking and using the same water that dinosaurs drank and used, you know, that early civilizations used. So what is done for water treatment? Well, unfortunately, some countries still allow uh, direct discharge of sewage of any water back into their water streams and they net, let na nature clean it with microorganisms in time. Now this works um, as long as you don't have millions of people doing this and as long as it's you know a big body of water. So in some countries where there's not a lot of um, industrialization, a lot going on, it's just a farming area, it's not heavily populated, this works just fine. Um, but unfortunately, in many areas, like in India, where there's a lot of people crowding into a small area, this isn't working so well. So especially as you move downstream, if it's a river, the pollution's adding up more and more and more. Some rural areas still use cesspools and septic tanks. Uh, some of you have a cabin, maybe you're aware that you have a cesspool or septic tank up there, where there's not easily available uh, sewage systems to uh, carry it out of there. It's done right on site in these cesspools and septic tanks. And what happens is it holds the wastewater while bacteria breaks it down. So it, it mimics what nature would do. It just holds it in one spot rather than letting it go back into the groundwater or into your lakes. And then most commonly, especially in the United States, is different municipalities or different cities have wastewater treatments. In Brooklyn Park, it's up on 85th. Got tennis courts up above it, but they go through a specific uh, series of steps to remove hazardous materials from the water, and that's both organic and inorganic. Inorganic uh, things are like the heavy metals, nitrates, dioxins, those things, and then the organic are the bacteria and things, the microorganisms that can cause disease. And wastewater treatment yields the cleanest and safest water for drinking, but it's the most expensive, so that's why in developing countries um, it's unusual to see uh, wastewater treatment at anything beyond the primary level. So looking at the primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment, each one of these has a specific uh, process. So there's three levels of wastewater treatment. And water will go through each process in that order, and each level will further reduce the pollution um, and, of course, drive up the expense. So primary treatment is just screening. Um, this could be as simple as um, if you have a 
sewage drain by your house, you know, there's a grate over it. That does some screening to keep some leaves and twigs and stuff out. If you've seen a culvert, there's maybe some kind of screening there. That's considered primary treatment. Um, as it goes into the water treatment facility, there's a finer screen or grid that filters out the big stuff. Um, it also helps to screen out the floating stuff like grease, only lets the lower water through. So it takes out some of the stuff. It helps reduce the biological oxygen demand by 30 to 40 percent, but it doesn't do anything to make your water safer to drink. Secondary treatment starts looking at the stuff that actually is bad for us and getting some of that out. It involves using bacteria and bacteria need oxygen, so they add oxygen to the water at this point or aerate it. And it's called the activated sludge process. And the wastewater passes through this sludge of aerobic bacteria. And the bacteria get to work on removing a lot of the stuff that drives up the biological demand. So this will remove about 90% of the biological demand on your water system. It's not removing any of the inorganic stuff, but it's taking out a lot of the organic stuff. And what they do is they fill, uh, the water fills up with decomposed suspending molecule or particles as it reacts with the aerobic bacteria. And then they allow that stuff to settle to the bottom of a tank and then take the water off the top. And now it's getting safer to drink, still not what most of us would consider safe to drink. Tertiary treatment then involves removing the inorganic matter plus any remaining organic matter. So this is where the nitrates, the phosphates, and the heavy metals get taken out. They're removed by precipitation. Uh, the heavy metals are with a uh, metal sulfide, so they react it with dihydrogen sulfide and get it to precipitate out as a metal sulfide, and that'll settle to the bottom. Again, these are heavy metals, so they're going to tend to sink. The phosphates are also precipitated out. They're, this is done by adding calcium or aluminum. And so the inorganic matter, uh, typically we add things that they react easily with and get them to precipitate out. The remaining organic matter is typically removed with chlorine. So other tertiary methods to be aware of is they can always also use ion exchange instead of precipitation. You can use this to remove nitrates or salt, but it's uh, more expensive, so it's not done very often with cities. You can also use biological methods to remove nitrates. You can use an activated carbon bed uh, to help remove some of the organics. This is done with a lot of fish tank filters. You can use distillation and get very pure water. But the problem with all of these is that they're slow and expensive, especially distillation. Um, but it just it's not a real viable option for large amounts of water for a city. Reverse osmosis is one that a lot of people use in their homes, but again, it's expensive, but it uses pressure greater than the osmotic pressure. So usually osmosis flows from where there's less solvent, or from where there's more solvent to where there's less solvent, or it flows from where, from where there's less solute to where there's more solute. So it goes from the less concentrate to the more concentrated side to diffuse it. And instead, it reverses that process. And so you get even purer water. You leave the solute behind. And then the organic material in the tertiary step, again, usually chlorine is used around here. You can also use ozone, but it'll kill off any remaining microorganisms. Chlorine is preferred because it lasts longer and it has what's called a residual effect on the pathogenic bacteria. So um, again, it sticks around, it does its job longer. The problem is it doesn't kill viruses and it has been known to produce carcinogens in the water. Although that's fairly unusual. So I would say, you know, most municipalities use chlorine. Ozone's more expensive and it does kill viruses. Um, it's more effective initially, but it has a shorter retention time and it doesn't have a residual effect on bacteria. So it's kind of a toss up which one of those to go with, but most cities in the United States would use one of these to get out any remaining organics. So primary takes out the big chunks, starts lowering the BOD, Secondary really goes after the organic stuff, getting out 90% um, of that stuff. And then tertiary takes out your inorganic issues and cleans up the remaining organic issues.